How's it going, everyone? And welcome to week three of my recording guide tutorial series. Uh, this time, we are going to take a look at creating a template for getting straight into recording, choosing a drum sound and kind of mixing it a little bit, uh, and choosing the song that you want to do. Um, so let's start out by looking at how you make a template. This is the normal template that I normally use um, with things organized as necessary. So starting up here at the top is all the drum stuff that I've got. Um, which we'll talk more in depth about the drum stuff specifically at the very end of this video or towards the end of this video, I guess probably before I actually talk about arranging this song. Um, so we start, I, I always put the drums right at the top. That's just how I'm used to it. And then I put my other MIDI instruments, uh, so like VSTs and stuff, um, in the section below that. Then I put all the bass stuff below that, all clean stuff below that, rhythms below that, leads below that, and then my effects leads below that. Now, notably, I have things color coded. There's a very good reason why I color code things, because if I don't color code things, I don't know where the hell anything is. Um, especially considering the fact that over here, this is the mixing window. The channels are all uh, colored on the bottom. Now I'll get into how to actually find the mixing window and stuff like that once we actually get to the mixing portion of this uh, tutorial series. But uh, for right now, I'm just going to talk about making tracks, making folders, and keeping things organized. So right down here, I'm just going to create um, another drum uh, preset. So we create drums. Uh, specifically, I am using Native Instruments Contact. Um, sorry. Uh, God, I don't like this. Okay. Um, rack view. There we go. Stop doing that. Uh, so, I am very specifically for this. I use uh, the Gecko Drums Periphery 5 Signature Pack. Eventually. I think I accidentally loaded two of them. Whoops. Okay. So you'll be able to hear this now. Uh, which it sounds like this. That's just how it sounds stock. It sounds pretty freaking good stock. Um, but like for this, obviously some of you guys know that Periphery is my favorite band of all time. Um, and this drum kit is off of like basically the actual sounds that were used for their most recent record, Periphery 5. Um, and every single one of these presets is uh, a version of the drum kit for that song. So here's like Wildfire, this is it, completely dry. Versus Turbo, which is basically they apply a little bit of processing to all the stuff. Uh, but then they also do like Atropos. Which I love how that snare sounds. But there's also like uh, my personal favorite, Dying Star. Well, the symbols will all sound the same. Now, something very crucial that you gotta do with drum kits like this is you gotta. You gotta route them out, so that way you can mix them all individually. Not not if you're using, like, Easy Drummer. I mean, I guess you can do. Let me pull up a, an instance of Easy Drummer. Yeah, you can do. You can do with Easy Drummer. You can route everything out. But, like, everything is already mixed as it is. Um, like, I believe the one I used specifically was Prog Rock. No, it wasn't that one. Uh, Ringy Rock. Wasn't that one either. I Tight, I think it was. I don't remember. I don't remember what the drum kit I always used to use was. Um, I guess I could always go and find it after the fact. But... Like, you can go to the mixer here. And what you can do is you can take every individual channel here. Every individual... Uh, so you have, like, the kick, which is your bass drum here. The snare, which is... 
this guy, uh, the hi-hat, the toms, the overheads, which includes the cymbals, and then the room sound, which if I turn that up, Whew, that's freaking loud. It's pretty cool, but what you can do is you can take this, uh, we keep the kick drums on the same channel, put the snare drums on the next channel up, uh, the toms will go on to channel 3, the hi-hat and overheads will go on to channel 4, the ambience will go on to channel 5, and then I'll set all of these last ones to a channel at the very end because I don't want to hear them. So now... It's just the kick drum on itself. Now, I don't know how... On itself? What the hell am I saying? I don't know how this works for uh, other DAWs. This is just how you do it in Cubase. You go up to Studio. You click on VST Instruments. That pulls up this window right here. And what you can do is you can click on Inputs and Outputs, Activate Outputs, and then you activate up to whatever number of channels you're using. I think it was just the first five. Yeah. And then over in the mix window, uh, all of those channels are created as mixer presets. So what I can do is I can create like a super basic, really snare heavy mix of the drum kit. And like I can also do like weird panning and crap like this. So, that's how you do that in Cubase. And you'll want to do that because having individual control over each individual part of the drum kit is really, 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 really useful. Um, now, notably right here, I do actually have a little bit of processing happening on the drum kit. But, for right now, I'm going to leave this drum kit completely raw. I have... The Dying Star preset uh, with turbo turned off, and the only processing I'm doing is my backline compression, which looks like this. Uh, this is just an instance of virtual mix rack. I'll talk about VST effects and stuff that you can get later, and alternatives that you can that can allow you to do this without having to buy stupidly expensive things like this. Um, and then on the toms, I put a an EQ that generally looks like this, uh, which I'll talk about this more once we get to the mixing portion. Um, but that's just, the kit just sounds like this. That's a completely dry with all of the faders at unity up at zero. Um, something of importance that I will say about this is that I do have the symbols themselves. So the way that it works in GGD plugins is if you go to symbols, every single one of the individual symbols is what's called spot mic'd. So the hats, the splash, the ride, the crash ride, and the stack. They're all individually spot mic'd, meaning that there's a microphone individually on each of them. So I could solo the hats, or the ride, that one, um, or the crash ride, Etc. Etc. So like they're all spot mic so that way you can actually you could control them individually here. But I send them all to their own individual channels, or I, I send them all to one channel. But the overheads, which is the microphone set that will go above the drum kit overall to capture the overall kit, kind of kind of ish close up, is on its own separate channel. Which if I just solo the the overheads. And uh, if I go back to the symbols, like the snare and all these shells don't don't bleed through. Just a little bit hyper real, but that's uh, that's how it be. So you get this general picture of the drum sound, plus also super in like incredibly deep control over the individual symbols themselves. Now the room mics, which sound like this.
if you are doing a metal mix in some in any variety, sometimes the room mics are called the ambience mics. The room mics are very, very important for this sound. They are crucial to making the snare sound explosive and for making the kick or the kit overall sound big. So make sure you pay attention to what you're doing with these room mics. They will make or break the mix. Uh, anyway, so I have the hats or uh, the symbols and the overheads going to their own separate channels. Uh, the symbols all on one channel and the overhead separately. The rooms are all going to their own separate channel. And all the toms are sent out to individual channels as well. Uh, three, four, and five. But if we go over to the mix window here, they are summed. So the toms are summed into this tom sum bus. And the symbols and overheads are summed into this overhead bus. Um, the way you do this is you have your channels here. If you go up here, this is your routing, you have the inputs at the top, the inputs will always be at the top, and then the output will be at the bottom. And if you click on this output thing, uh, it'll show you all the places you can send it to. I'll talk a little bit more about everything that's here in a second. Uh, the main out that I have here, this is the channel where, uh, like, this is the channel where everything gets sent out to the speakers and then you actually hear something when you're exporting. Um, in order to create bus channels, what you do is you click on Incubase This Plus, click on uh, Group, and always make it outside of a folder. Uh, title it, make sure it's stereo as well. Make sure it's stereo. And then give it a name and then add the track. So now I have Group 11 that I can send things to. So if I wanted to, I could send the toms to Group 11 here. Uh, obviously, I'm not actually going to do that. I um, already have my template set up as it is. Uh, and like same thing goes for the symbols and overheads. And you'll notice that every single one of the, ch uh, the um, instrument sections has a separate bus that everything is routed into. And this is just because I've fallen into this trap before. If you don't set up individual buses, as they're called, for each instrument section, then you will be mixing all of them independently from each other, and that will destroy your computer. Um, back in 2021, when I was doing the medleys, I was having a hard time uh, with recording what would end up becoming the Sonic the Hedgehog medley, uh, because I was doing exactly that. I had the exact same processing on every single lead guitar, which was like three plugins, but still was a lot, um, without realizing that I didn't need to do that. I think I did it for the rhythms as well. So don't do that, is the point that I'm trying to get at. Um, anyway, something of crucial importance here is that the drum sound does not need to be perfect before you start recording. If you, All you need to do is get it to a point where you can hear it over everything else. The template that I'm using right now actually is very slightly different to the way that I normally have it, and that's because I have been meaning to change the um, template a little bit because it is it has a little bit of mixing going on, and I don't want it to have a little bit of mixing going on. So I'm very deliberately um, setting everything back to Unity Gain. Everything is exactly at zero, and, well, with the exception of the reverb over there. Uh, this master verb thing. We'll talk about that when we get to mixing. Um, everything's at zero, and that's how it's going to be for when we start recording. Uh, now, something of note when it comes to contact instruments. That's that's what I'm using here. This thing is called contact. Um, something of importance here is that you do need to set up the... Um, you do need to set up the outputs to be a set of stereo outputs that um, that are used when routing out the kit. Um, the output routing out outputs is pretty much exactly the same thing. Uh, these channels just go out to individual ones, but you have to create those channels for uh, contact to decide to use them. Um, you can use any of the presets that are here, but you'll probably have to reload the individual plugin, which in order to do that, you just click this X, and then you just add in the instrument again. Um, now, with that being said, 
let's get to arranging and choosing a song. Um, in terms of picking a song out of the potential pool of thousands of different video game songs that you could do, do not under any circumstances select a song because it is popular. Select a song because you enjoy it and because you want to cover it. For example, the song Cotton Candy, which I covered last year around July, that cover was done when that song was popular, and it was perfect timing for it as well. But I didn't do that cover in the first place because the song was popular. I genuinely like the song Cotton Candy. So I don't do covers because a song is popular. I do covers because I like a song to begin with. So... For the purposes of this, I'll be using the song Starlight Zone, as I said last week when I was talking about um, the guitar tones. So I'm using the song Starlight Zone from Sonic the Hedgehog 1. song's so freaking good. Um, so, here's what we're going to do. Is, instead of leaving things exactly as they are and covering loops of the song, you can do that if you're totally fine with that, but I think that's incredibly boring. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut up the song. Uh, pressing 3 will give you the scissors that does splits, and you can just cut. I will... Again, talk about things related to other DAWs uh, based on questions I get in the comments. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut up sections. So there's only two sections to this song. There's an A section and a B section. Um, now, I'm not... I've... I've been ruined by Family Jewel's arrangements of this song because his version uses the B section as a verse. And uses this as a chorus. And I can't hear it any other way than that. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try my absolute damnedest to... Uh, arrange this in such a way that isn't copying Jules' arrangement of it. Um, and man, I really should not listen to this song, or Jules' version of this song, before doing this. Um, I was thinking about speeding up the track, but I ultimately chose not to. I want this song to be a little bit, a little bit more chill, but still have energy. So we're going to pretend that this is starting with the chorus. And then this is the verse. <laughs> and I'm now trying to picture exactly how I want to do this. Maybe I'll do... So, okay. Sorry, in order to make markers, in Cubase, you click Add Track, and then click on Marker. And then that just creates a thing, and you click on this plus, add a position marker, and then you can uh, type the name up here. Uh, under the thing that says Description. You can also add other notes, and I recommend you do so. Um. Yeah, we'll put in like four bars of silence. Ba -ba -da -da -da. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Um And here we create a solo. Now, something of importance here, something that's very crucial to the sound that I do is that I always try to create a section that is dedicated to a solo. It doesn't have to be uh, particularly long. I have done a lot of long solos before, but I 
don't think that you have to do a particularly long solo. Like this, I'm probably just going to do an 8-bar solo. You know, just for fun. Why not? So, oh, let me do a little bit of music theory in my head really quick. I want to do a key change here. Um, so, one, two, three, four. Wait, three. Yeah, that actually kind of works. It'll sound weird, but remember, this is actually not how it's going to sound when we finalize it. Oh, I freaking love the harmony of this song, it's so good! And we put a another solo there. Okay, so notably it's ending there a little bit abruptly. Um, reason for that is that I'm just gonna have it hold out on this, and I don't want to be hearing the. Ba, ba, I don't want it to be. I don't want to be hearing that as I'm recording it. I like having it pretend like it actually ends. So, so that is the arrangement. Uh, just shy of four minutes. Nice. Um. So now's the point. Save the fucking thing. Um. Important thing of note, keep your shit organized. Don't just have it loose on your computer. Like, I have the Cubase folder, the year, and then a covers folder. Wow, look at some of the other things I'm doing this year. Um, this is, of course, uh, Starlight Zone. Kind of fun to be actually uh, doing this cover at this point. Anyway. So, with that in mind... Uh, that pretty much covers everything for today. Um, yeah, I got the arrangements. So, like, the, the idea that I'm going for here is, like, when I'm adding these section markers, I'm adding them with the idea of what it is that I want to do with that section. Um, for instance, right here, this uh, course with clean rhythms and a soft lead. I have a preset that is called soft lead. Uh, it's just, like, a lightly... Uh, gained up uh, Powerball, angle Powerball. Um, and uh, the one thing that I notably haven't done here is that I haven't uh, specified which guitar is going to be used for which section, but usually I flip them. So what will happen here, like for this section, uh, is this first four bars. Because I know this uh, section loops is I'll have this first bit be done with one of the guitars, and this second bit, that second bit, done with the other. So, uh, with that in mind, um, note that, like, you don't need to know... You don't need to know um, music theory in order to come up with a key change. There are tricks that can be used to make it work. Like, the reason why this works... Uh, is because, let me get a piano here. Um, so, like, if we go from here... So the reason that works is the chords go D minor, G minor, uh, B flat major, I know it's A sharp, but it's B flat, uh, to E flat. And that right there is a way of doing kind of a 2 5 1 esque thing without like two would be this. But uh, it's like kind of almost ish a 2 5 1, but it's like the point is like it's weird music theory jargon and you don't really need to know it. Um, I could get really in depth onto how this works, but I am not qualified for that. So uh, just know that it does. 
anyway, so that's going to do it for this week of um, of this journey into making these covers. Uh, next time, we're going to take a look at um, writing a drum track, creating synthesizer elements, and learning the song by ear. So, thank you guys very much for watching. See you in the skies, Jagonites. All the best, and take care.